é colunista da Forbes.com e tem artigos publicados no Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Investor Business Daily, entre outros veículos. Por favor, com a palavra, Yaron Brook. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. How's everybody doing? It's, uh, it's late in the day, I know, so thank you for sticking around. Um, I was happy to hear the governor um, this evening uh, tell us that they have discovered the methods of, corporate, of, co of corporations, uh, meritocracy, planning, and strategy. It's about time. It's only taken about two centuries for them to figure this out. But let me just say, let me just say that I can tell the governor, unfortunately he's not here, that it will not work. It cannot work. No matter the best intentions that he and his political allies have, the methods of business do not work for government. Because the two, the two are very fundamentally different. What is it that allows business to work? How does business, what is business, how does business determine what merit is? It determines it through profit. And how does a business make profit? It makes profit by creating a good and trading it with you. And if you don't like the good, you don't buy it. If you don't like the price of the good, you don't buy it. So the only way a business can make money is by providing you a good you want at the price you're willing to pay for it. Because that good will make your life better. I like using my iPhone in presentations. Right? I bought this for $300 from Apple. Who lost? Nobody. This is worth more than $300 to me in productivity, in cool factor. And it's worth less than $300 to Apple because they make a profit. And all the senior executives at Apple are compensated based on my and your willingness to buy this for $300. And if they make a bad iPhone, they won't get the compensation. So business relies on voluntary exchange. Business relies on our acceptance of their product for the right price, for the right quality. Not to mention all the competition, right? They have to continuously innovate. They have to make this better all the time. Because otherwise, I'm going to buy a Samsung. I'm not going to buy an Apple. That's what markets do. Nobody has to... Plan markets, nobody does plan markets. You can't plan markets. I mean, imagine a bureaucrat, with all due respect to the bureaucrats, creating one of these. Sitting down 20 years ago and planning an iPhone. It would look like the whole screen here. No way. It doesn't happen. It cannot happen. And the incentives are not there. He cannot know my preferences, what I like, what I won't like. He cannot know all of your preferences. This is the beauty of the market. Read Bastiat. What is government about? So business is about profit. Profit that relates win-win transactions because they're voluntary transactions. Because we can walk away from the transactions. But what is government? Now, George Washington, I think, said it best. He said, government is force. Government is coercion. I don't think the government's doing a good job, so I'm not going to pay my taxes this year, right? <laughs> what happens if you don't pay your taxes this year? You go to jail. Let's not make pretty this up. This is what it is. It's force. It's coercion. So how do we compensate people in government? Based on what? Based on how happy we are? Well, how do you measure that? Yes, I know once a year we all vote, right? Once every four years we all vote. We all vote on a big package of goodies they've handed out to us and promises they can make to us. 
You can tell I'm not running for office. Uh, but there's no mechanism by which we can evaluate on a constant basis the work that they do. There's no mechanism of profit. There's no standard. So government is coercion. Business is voluntary exchange. You cannot take the methodology of voluntary exchange and apply it to coercion. It doesn't work. It cannot work. There are no measures. There's no meritocracy. It cannot and will not. Now, we're here to talk about public spending, an interesting term. I hate the word public. Public anything. Right? I'm part of the public. Does anybody ask me how to spend this public spending? How about you guys? You guys get to decide how the money is going to be spent? No. It's government spending. It's government schools. It's government health care. It's government infrastructure. There's no public. There's no us. We don't get to make decisions. Yes, we vote. We vote for candidates, and the candidate gets into office, and he has to represent the public. But we don't have access to this candidate. Who does? Well, a myriad of pressure groups and spe so-called special interest groups who are going to influence him and pull him and push him and get him to spend on this project, on that project, and if he spends, we'll give him campaign money, we'll give him a nice loan. Who knows, you know, depending on the degree of corruption. You can vary. Right? But it's not us making decisions. It's some black box of decision-making in politics that is influenced by gangs, by groups with different agendas and different programs who are pulling and pushing in different directions. There's no such thing as the public interest. There's no such thing as the common good. Where is it? I know what your interest is. I know what my interest is. But where's our interest? Where is it? Can't point to it. The public, the common, are just individuals. Individuals with all kinds of tastes, with all kinds of interests, with all kinds of incentives, with all kinds of preferences. It's a myth, a very sophisticated myth, a very clever myth to sell us on a public good, on some good that benefits all of us somehow, mysteriously, mystically, without ever telling us how. It doesn't exist. But it's great propaganda. And what does this public good mean at the end of the day? It means that you as an individual need to do what? Well, we need to take your money to achieve this big public good. We don't care about your preferences. We don't care about your interests. We care about this undefinable thing. And well, it's fine. It's fine. And, you know, we're going to sacrifice the minority for the majority because we live in democracy, right? The majority decided. So the majority has decided to take your money and give it to somebody over there, right? Did they ask you? Is it in your interest? No. But it's in the public interest. Now, why do we buy into this? Why do we buy into this idea? And re remember, I, I think Margaret Thatcher said, uh, Margaret Thatcher said, uh, there's no such thing as government money. There's only taxpayer money. Right? There's no such thing as a pool of money that the public has. There's just your money. And they take it away from you. They tax it. And what's the consequence? What are the consequences of those taxes? What are the consequences of taking your money away from you? on the scale that government today does it. It means you have less. It means you have less to buy the things that you want for you. It means that you, if you're a young entrepreneur who wants to start a shoe company, as you're working and trying to save money to build that company up, 40, 50, 60 percent of that money is gone. It's going to take you longer, if ever, to start this company. You as an entrepreneur being sacrificed for what? The public good, the common interest. So don't worry. Right? If you're a young couple trying to save for a home, well, it's going to take you a lot longer to save for a home. It's going to take you a lot longer to save for a car. 
And when you buy the car, it's probably going to be a lot older car than what you would have bought if they hadn't taken 40, 50, 60 percent of your money every single year. If you're a businessman and they're taking all this money from you, it means that you're not investing in another, in another plant. You're not investing in new products. You're not expanding your business. You're not creating jobs. You've got less profit. You're buying fewer things. You're investing in fewer companies. What is the consequence of that? Well, there are fewer jobs in the economy. Economic growth is stagnant because they took your money away. Why? Because, you know, it's for the public good. It's for the common good. You're supposed to sacrifice for that. Who are you to say no? Why is your expenditures, why are your preferences important? You don't count. So on a macroeconomic level, you get fewer jobs, you get slower growth, you get, you hurt the people you're, you're pretending to be helping. Because who needs the jobs more than anybody else? The young and the poor. Where do we have, in the entire West, where do we have the most unemployment today? Among the young and the poor. Because businesses, instead of creating jobs, are being taxed to death. Their money is being taken away from them so that they cannot create those jobs. They cannot create the wealth that makes the economy move, that makes, that creates progress. So taxes are destructive. They're destructive to individual lives. They're destructive to individual liberties. They reduce the scope of our choices. And they're destructive economically. They destroy jobs. They destroy growth. They destroy progress. They destroy entrepreneurship. They destroy the future. Now, governments have become very sophisticated. Because now they don't just tax us, right? They borrow money. Now, this is cool. Because this way, they can tax future generations. So they can coerce our children, our grandchildren, and our grandchildren who are not even born yet will have to pay the bill for the debt that the Americans and the Europeans at least, I don't know what the debt situation is in Brazil. So now they're coercing future generations. They have another trick up their sleeve, right? To pay for all this government spending. They can't print money. But printing money causes prices to rise, which is what? Another form of tax. Standard of living go down. Prices go up. So one way or the other, government spending is the cause of economic stagnation. One way or the other, government spending is the cause of slow growth, high unemployment, and a real threat, a real attack on individual liberty and individual choices. Now, what is the option? What is the alternative? Well, if government is about coercion, if government is about force, then it has no place in the marketplace. The marketplace is about voluntary transactions. It's not about force. It's not about guns. It's not about coercion. So what we need is a government that extracts itself from the marketplace that leaves the marketplace to business, that leaves the marketplace for profit, that leaves the marketplace to voluntary transactions. And what is the one thing, one area in life where we do need force, where coercion is necessary, where a gun is actually useful? Well, it's to protect us, to protect us from criminals, to protect us from murderers, to protect us from frauds, to protect us from foreign invaders, so it's the policing power. That's the one thing, the one thing the government is actually useful for. And by the way, the one thing that in this country, at least, it is failing miserably at. The governor mentioned all the different things the government does and how complicated it is. Well, I've got the solution. Stop doing them. Focus on this one thing. One. Now, what we really need in Brazil, in Western Europe, in America, 
What we really need is to discover a concept that was discovered in the 18th century, in the Enlightenment, with the founding of the United States of America. The founders of America created a unique country for its time. A country based on a completely new principle that had never existed before in political life. Because before the establishment of America, and this is the real revolution, by the way, of America. The revolution wasn't about taxes. Taxes were a minor issue. The fundamental revolution is an intellectual revolution. It is the answer to this question. Who does your life belong to? Who does your life belong to? Before 1776, your life, my life, our lives belong to the tribe, the state, some collective, some group, the king, the queen. But the American founder said, no, your life belongs to you. My life belongs to me. It doesn't belong to the group. It doesn't belong to the collective. And in that sense, there is no public good. Because the public good requires me to sacrifice to the group, requires me to think of my life as being a servant to the group. My life is mine. I should get to decide what to do with it and how to do it. And starting with Locke, through the founding fathers, they conceptualized this idea of our lives belonging to each other. They conceptualized it into the idea of individual rights. And individual rights is the notion that each person's life is their own, to do with as they please. That the role of government is there to protect them from coercion, from force. And that's it. When they talk about the right to life, they talk about the right for you to live your life as you see fit, to do as you see fit, as long as you're not hurting somebody else. Physical force. As long as you're not coercing somebody, as long as you're not defrauding somebody, the state has no role, has no involvement in your life. You have a right to pursue your rational values, the things that will make your life the best life that it can be for you. And they understood that I am not in a position to tell you what those values are. And I certainly shouldn't be in a position to coerce you into doing what I think is good for you. Because it's your life. It's not my life. It's not our life. So if we care about freedom, and this is, after all, the Liberty Forum, if we care about liberty, what we need to fight for what we need to dedicate ourselves to is this concept of individual rights. We need to rediscover this idea that each one of us has an inalienable, inalienable. You know what inalienable means? It means nobody can take it away from you. Not even a democratic vote. Not even a democratic vote. You have a right to free speech. You can't vote that away. You have a right to property. Nobody should be able to vote that away. It's inalienable. It's yours by your very nature as a human being. It is a requirement for your survival. So we need to rediscover this idea of an inalienable right, an inalienable right to your own life, to live it as you see fit, to pursue the rational values that are necessary for you to achieve your happiness, because it's about happiness in the end, your happiness my happiness, there ain't no group happiness. It's about the right to liberty. Liberty is about free speech. Liberty is about freedom of ideas. Liberty is about having ideas and executing on them and being left alone to do so and not being imposed on. And then I think the most revolutionary statement may be in political history. Each one of us has an inalienable right to pursue our own happiness. Not to get happiness, not to have a job, not to get stuff, but to pursue, to try, to act, to work for, to try to achieve our own, our own 
happiness. Not the groups, not the publics, not the common good. And let you give me one quick principle around rights. Because people talk about a right to health care, a right to education, a right to all kinds of things. This is the quick way to remember what is a right and what isn't a right. You cannot have a right to somebody else's stuff. You cannot have a right to somebody else's money. You cannot have a right to somebody else's time. You cannot have a right to somebody else's goods. You cannot have a right to somebody else's talent. Because if you did have a right to their talent, their money, their time, then they would be your slave. And what about their rights? What you do have a right to. What you do have a right to, and it's time we stood up and demanded that right. We have a right to be free. We have a right to be free from coercion. We have a right to pursue our lives as we see fit, free from the state coercing us. Thank you all. Professor Brook, certamente para a gente poder debater, entender e tentar melhorar as instituições, é fundamental compreender muito bem os conceitos. O senhor trouxe de uma maneira muito clara qual é o conceito do indivíduo, a diferença entre o público e o governamental, e isso é muito importante para o nosso debate. Obrigado.